Hey everybody, how you doing? Um, I went live tonight. Um, I've seen that there was a few things that were said, and um, some people, you know, like I said, they come over to my page, saw a photograph, took it upon themselves to go to a, a chat um, site and post and start making some comments about what I, I did, what I did. So first of all, I want to explain why I did what I did. Um, first of all, um, it's easy to sit there and say that your daughter died in a house fire. It was ruled an arson. But unless you actually see what happened to my daughter and what they did to my daughter, you'll never understand what, what really went on. So, um, by me showing her picture, it kind of showed a story behind of what this person or person did to my little girl. Um, but at the same time, I posted it on my Facebook page. So by me posting it on my Facebook page, the only people that can see that are friends with me. And um, so by these people coming onto my page, seeing that picture and then going to another site and making the comments about it and everything, I didn't ask you to come on that page and look at it. You made that choice. By you making that choice, to me, you disrespected me and my daughter by going to another site and posting the remarks that you did. Um, number two, um, I know that somebody made some comments that I gave out an address and everything. I didn't give out an address. First of all, what I did was I said a greenhouse in Bel Air. Now, if you drive through Bel Air, which is a pretty good sized area, there's probably 15 greenhouses. So, but what I'm trying to say by this, if you're going to get on my page and you're going to bash me or my daughter, expect me to knock on your front door. I don't hide my address. I don't make fake accounts to go on and spy on other people's pages. I am who I am. I'm Donald Branham. And this is about my daughter. And one of the things I wanted everyone to see is this right here on this table is what I've done for 11 years. This is the evidence I have. So by you going on another page and saying what the mother told you or what the mother's done or the mom gets somebody else to post up, trust me with what I have here, I can back every single bit of work that I do and what I say. I have no reason to lie. I have no reason to steer people the other direction. My goal is to find the person that killed my baby girl that night. Now, by me posting certain things that I have posted, I've never said that I'm the one that said those things. And for anybody to go on another post and disrespect the firemen that risked their lives and their family sitting at home knowing that their husband or their wife was out there risking their life to save my baby girl is disrespect to them. They have no reason to lie at the time of that night of what happened. No one at that time even knew it was an arson. So they had no reason to lie that, that there was a truck sitting in the middle of the road, that the mother was standing on the porch, and that the mother and the boyfriend waited 20 minutes to let somebody know that my baby girl was in that bedroom. And I want to praise every mother, every woman, every father that has come up to me and said that one key thing, I'd have died with my baby trying to get him out of that house. Because that's a true statement. So for anybody that goes out here and bashes of anything about what I do and what I've done. But I can tell you one thing. A lot of people know me. And I can guarantee you one thing. I wouldn't have been standing on a porch. I'd have been there with my baby girl. I'd have gave my life. Because that's what you're supposed to do as a parent. As a parent, we're supposed to sacrifice our lives to save our children. It ain't something that you think about. 
It ain't something that you second guess. It happens. Instinct. An instinct kicks in and it tells you to save your baby. So tonight, other things I want to discuss is, like I said, here's 11 years. This is what I've been doing my 11 years. Instead of being able to sit back and enjoy my wife and my children and do the things that other parents are doing with their kids, I'm spending my time trying to find out what happened to my daughter. Because one thing I can say is I do love my baby. One of the things that was also brought up is that the mother had custody. And, you know, sometimes it gets to the point where, you know, you get tired of always showing documents and stuff to prove somebody else is wrong. Because I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to prove to nobody. Because I know one thing that is the truth. I am the only one clear. And my wife, of my daughter's death. By me being clear, if you understand what the word clear means, it means I had nothing to do with my child death. And still today, 11 years and about six months, no one else has ever been cleared. And that is written by the fire marshals. I know the mother has told everybody that she's been cleared. She passed the lie detector test. No, she did not. And I can sit here and say that because I know for a fact she'll never show a document that shows she was cleared. She'll never show a document that she passed a lie detector test. It says inconclusive. Her brother, by the way, failed a lie detector test twice. So if you're going to sit here and make statements, show your paperwork because I have mine. And back to, like I said, my daughter went to stay with her mother. And there was a story behind why my daughter chose to stay with the mother. It was not what Joy Stanforth or anybody else said that the mom, that the my baby girl wanted to go live with her mom. She was tricked into going living with that mother. I know this for a fact. And we're not going to go into that part, but I can tell you one thing. Right here is the document, and it says right here on this paper, Donald Brandon and Mary Brandon, who will be referred as Donald and Mary, or as the parties or parents in this agreement are requesting shared custody of their three minor children. They agree to share physical legal responsibility for the general care, control, and custody of their children and have agreed to share parenting. And this was dated back on January 5th, 2006. Now, the only error I made was I said that my daughter went and lived, started to stay with her mom on January 3rd, 2006, because that's usually when kids go back to um, school after the Christmas break. But the document right here, and it says right here, January 5th, 2006, is when my daughter went to stay with her mother. Now, three months later, April 27th, 2006, my daughter was murdered. So, um, that's something, like I said, people got on there that wants to defend my, the, the mother and everything else. Like I said, I'm not the one pointing the fingers. I'm no different than anybody else. I've gone through all these documents right here, tons of them, and everything that I have seen, everything I have read that's written by uh, Children's Services, Paint Valley, the Sheriff's Office reports, the fire marshals, everybody's reports. It states that the mother and the boyfriend are involved. Now, do I believe that the mother killed my daughter? No. Do I believe the mother maybe gave her some kind of a drug? And, um, and that drug kept my daughter from getting off that bed? Yes. Do I believe that somebody was messing with my child? Yes. And that's another thing I want to explain, too, of the comments about rape and molestation. Um, they did find male DNA in my daughter's bedroom. That's a fact. And for that male DNA to be in my daughter's bedroom would only be two people's DNA that should be in that bedroom. 
And one of them would be the boyfriend because you know, let's say he tucked her in that night or something. Uh, the other DNA would be mine. And uh, I've already gave my DNA. And my DNA was already given and already was cleared. But I've also was cleared of the fire too. And uh, so no other male DNA would be in there. So for male DNA to be in that bedroom and found in that bedroom, if it's not somebody related under the age of 18 to my daughter, because they did do DNA on children that went to school with my daughter, male subjects, and so far all of them have passed, um, it would be molestation. Um, but for somebody over the age of 18, and for them to hit that male DNA, it would be rape, because there's no reason for that male DNA to be on my daughter. Um, I know everybody knows that the clothes were destroyed. Um, Dr. Gay's not here to explain why they were destroyed. Um, and I've got a couple tapes I'm going to play tonight. Um, like I said, I have been, um, fighting this since the, since the year of 2004, um, with the injuries of my children and everything else. Um. I know people are trying to dig up stuff on my background and everything. I've, I've never had a felony. I've always had misdemeanors. Um, yeah, I've had a protection order against me. Yes, I had another protection order against me, which if by law, if you was to read it, and if you understand protection orders, and I will show you how <coughs> sometimes uh, Fayette County makes mistakes, is to get a CPO order, the only way you would get a CPO order is you have to be either A, married to that person, or B, related to that person within the family. And the other protection order I had against me was because I made a phone call because the man called my house till 3 o'clock in the morning, and I threatened the man and his family on the phone um, to quit calling my house at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I got a protection order against me. Now, I'm not A, related to that man. B, I'm not related or married to that man. So, shows right there that I had a protection order put against me instead of a restraining order. Um, now, the protection order with my ex-wife, and here's the story behind that. Uh, I was at home Christmas Eve, wrapped in gifts. My ex-wife asked to go out that night. I gave her permission. Told her to go ahead. She could go out and have a good time. Instead, she goes out and meets a man, which is the man that she's with today. Uh, when she showed up in my apartment, uh, the kids were asleep. I told her to leave. She left. She went and got an apartment across the street at a different apartment complex. She called me up when I went to her the house. The first time I went there, she was naked, wanted to have sex. Told her I didn't want to have sex. I just watched Kitty Mossberger leave her apartment in his semi. So the next day, same thing. The third day, she asked me again. And I refused to do anything. And she said, give me a second. I'm going to go home. Or I'm going to go do some running errands. I'll be back. When she left, she walked into Crime Victim Witness. Told him a bunch of stories. Come back and actually handed me the protection order. And then, as she handed me the protection order, she picks up the phone and calls the police. I go back to my apartment. The police show up there. City Courthouse Police Department did. They asked me, do I have a protection order? I said, yeah, here's what she handed me. He said, the officer said, oh, she handed this to you? I said, yes. He said, you need to go to crime victim witness and tell them what just happened. So, back then, protection orders, anybody could walk in, say they're scared, get a protection order. Now the laws have changed where now they've got to show where you actually, the police came to your house, they've done something to that person, there's a police report on domestic, it's got to be a paper trail, then they get a protection order. So by posting those things on there, you know, like I said, I've told people I ain't having, I got nothing to hide. Um, another charge I have on me was theft. Everybody pretty much that knows me. It was caused by my sister's house in Larry Mongo. 
Larry Mongo walked in the police department, wrote up his own police report, filed his own charges, and had an officer come out and arrest me when the evidence they were trying to charge me with was sitting in the sheriff's office for over a month in their evidence room. So I don't know how I stole something a month later when it was already in the sheriff's office on, in ev their evidence room. But like I said, uh, I don't have to prove who I am. A lot of people know who I am. One thing I can tell you, I will fight for justice for McKenzie. No one will stop me from fighting for McKenzie. And if it means that I have to exhume my daughter again, I will do it. Whatever it takes to bring these people that hurt my child to justice is what counts. The other thing is, like I said, my children were molested. My children were were hurt in the care of this mother and boyfriend. And just um, to let everybody know, um, I won't give no names, but I, by posting the post that I posted from my daughter and everything, and, and by me telling the stories that I have told about what my daughter went through, and, and like I said, it's all right here in this Pink Valley envelope, what happened to my daughter. And this is my daughter. That's another thing I want people to understand. This is my daughter telling her story to a licensed psychologist. This is not me saying this happened to my kid. This is my daughter telling them. And for anybody to call my daughter a liar is just so disrespectful. And if children's services would have done their job, guess what? My daughter would be here today. My daughter would be running around. My daughter would have graduated. My daughter would have probably got married. My daughter would have had her starting her own family. So it's not the only things I do um, by fighting this um, to find out who killed my daughter. It's about a lot of things in this town. And when you sit on Facebook and you read stories after stories after stories about our children's services and what they haven't done or what they could have done, that was a, that's the whole reason I'm fighting as hard as I am too. There's changes and changes need to be made. Just like with exhuming McKenzie, the, one of the reasons McKenzie was exhumed is because DNA has gone so far now that there's a possibility a 90% chance they're going to find something. And it could be the answer to everything. Um, and not have to have those clothes or the ladder that they lost too. Um, I've been asking for six years for two tapes to be returned to me. And um, BCI, when they came and got all this that you see right here, and they took it to their office, and my tapes, they, they made copies, and then they took the copies and and they gave me the original back. The only person that hasn't done that is the Fayette County Sheriff's Office. And I've been talking to the detectives, and I've asked them about the tapes again and again, and I've been waiting a month, and then I keep getting excuses and everything else. Um, i rather them just be honest and say we lost them just like we lost the ladder, we lost some other things, and that's the whole issue here too, is why I'm fighting as hard as I am, is because... Things are misplaced or they want to blame somebody that's no longer here um, and they can't answer where something might be or whatever. But here's the thing. Um, nobody should have this stuff. Um, if you're running a sheriff's office the way you should run it, everything with McKenzie should be in one room, should be in boxes, should have her name on it, should also have a, a serial number that is her case file. So, should be able to go to one room and open up a box and say, here it is, Mr. Branham. Um, but that's not the case here. And I don't believe anybody left with my daughter's stuff and rode around in it with it in their car um, or anything like that. Um, if they'd have done the right job the right at the first time, a lot of this stuff wouldn't have been, been misplaced or lost. Um do I believe this will be solved? Yes, I do. Do I believe it with all my heart? Yes, I do. Um, I know some people are out there and they're trying to tear me down. And, and I'm going to tell you, it ain't going to happen. 
the, uh, the sheriff's office has tried. The every agency that's talked to me tells me I dwell on this too much, and the dwelling is eating me, and it's going to cause me to get upset and everything. Yeah, I am upset. Why wouldn't I be upset? Every time I turn around, there's something missing, something um, destroyed. Um, you know, uh, one thing I can tell you is the clothes, yes, they were relevant. And as you'll hear on the tape here in a minute, a detective is telling me, I asked the detective, find me one cop in the state of Ohio or the United States that can come to my house, look dead at me, and tell me my child's clothes weren't relevant to this case. And he'll give you your, his answer. Um, the other thing, like I was saying, is the other reason I'm fighting on this very hard. A lot of people don't know this. Um, but the boyfriend, he hurt a child at two years old for being the, being the bed. Now, you won't be able to find that case file now because it was sponged. But it was, the incident did happen in South Dakota. Um, I have that report. I'm not ready to show it yet. But I can tell you one thing. That's one child that did not belong to this boyfriend and he hurt him. Um, I know he hurt my kids that I have today, my boys. Um, I give my boys respect because they're not ready to talk or mention what they went through. Especially, um, a lot of it has to do with fear because... <clears throat> somebody did close my daughter's mouth and kept her from speaking and letting us know what happened. Um, but by me posting my story, I always say things happen for a reason. And one thing I can tell you, a young gentleman, and I'm not going to give his name um, for respect for him, but um, eventually you will hear from this, this gentleman. Um, he contacted me and between the ages of eight and 13 years old, pretty much everything that McKenzie went through, he went through. And it was sad for me to listen to this guy because he's a, he's a man now to tell me what he went through. And it was almost like I was feeling the pain again of what my daughter was trying to tell a psychologist and, and try to tell people what she was going through. And when I was listening to the story of the guy and he was explaining what uh, Mr. Mossberger did to him when he was a kid, uh, answers a lot of things. But it was so hard to listen to this kid and, and that he had the confidence and the heart to reach out to me. Um, sometimes children can't speak for themselves. And just like with Mackenzie, I'm her voice. Because her mother isn't. And people can say whatever they want to say about the mom. And, well, she don't want to come forward with a story. Well, here's why she don't want to come forward with a story. For her to come out and tell you a story, she's got to remember the 13 other stories that she told. And she can't remember those 13 stories. So she hides behind fear because once she tells a story, out of the 13 different stories she told, people are going to start coming and saying, wait a minute, that ain't what you told me how it happened. That ain't what you told me went on. That ain't what you told me how you left the house. So that's the reason the mother won't come forward. Now, here's another true statement. And I can play that tape at a later date too, because I taped it. And I asked the mother, I said, I will do everything I can I will go with you to the sheriff's office. I will back you 100% to help you clear your name. All I want you to do is tell what happened that night. And her exact words was, fuck you, motherfucker. So, for me to, her to tell me that made my head start thinking. And here's to her family that keys wanting to say their uh, remarks about me and everything else. Here's the one thing that catches me more than anything. If I'm trying to find out who killed my daughter and her daughter, 
And if she's telling the truth that she went to bed that night and slept in the bed and woke up in the middle of this fire, ain't I also, by trying to find out the person that killed McKenzie, trying to find the person that tried to kill her and her boyfriend? And as much as the evidence shows her direction, I still try to find out who killed my daughter, but I also am trying to find the same person that tried to kill them. So I asked the mother of my ex-wife one question. Why are you attacking me if I'm trying to find out who killed your granddaughter, but ain't I also trying to find out who tried to kill your daughter? And think about this and take time to think about it. If you were sleeping in the bed and somebody murdered your daughter, you surely wouldn't go on vacation right after the death of my daughter. Because wouldn't you be feared that that person's still out there? Wouldn't you be afraid that that person's going to find you in another state and finish the job? The only reason that you don't speak, the mother and the boyfriend, is because you are the person. And your actions speak louder than words. But you think it's funny and cute to send Christy Aders that lives right around the corner from me false document so they'll do the dirty work for you. And the reason you would do that is so nothing comes back on you. If you were going to be a true mother and the, and the death of my daughter means it to you, you would be on this side of the fence trying to find out who killed your daughter. Because I'll tell you what, I'm the one sticking my head out there. Because here's why. I know it ain't no stranger. I know it ain't no Joe Blow off the street that walked in that house and splashed stuff all the way up the stairs and walked a circle around your front room and then lit a fire. Because everybody, including your family, knows that that dog that you saved instead of your own child would have tore anybody's arm off that went into that house. And in your own statement, you never mentioned that the dog woke you up. You said you woke up to smoke, popping, and crackling noises. And like I've said this before, Kenny Mossberger, how did you talk to my daughter if you're 95% deaf and your hearing aid was inside that house? You never spoke to my child and neither did the mother. For the mother to speak to my child, she would have had to come in that foyer. And where the foyer was is where the hot spot was. So for a mother not to go to the hospital with no injuries, didn't stand in that foyer and carry a conversation with my daughter and tell my daughter to go to a window. And if that was true, if it is true, then explain to me how you and him left the scene and ran up the street to get help. If you just talk to your child and your child screaming, mommy, mommy, you leave her. You go up the road, you banging on doors. Number two, what I think a lot of people ought to do is take a ride in Jeffersonville. And if you take a ride in Jeffersonville, for somebody that was a 12-year volunteer fireman, why didn't you go to the fire station that was only two houses away on the same street? But these are questions we'll never get answers to. So, I want to start off one of the things, and I want to show you why I am mad and why I fight so hard. But, I'm going to go ahead and play one of the tapes. I'm hoping that you guys will be able to hear real good the tapes. The first one is my conversation with Dusty Roof a few months after my daughter's death. And, it's going to talk to you where I showed him everything that came from Paint Valley that was sent to Children's Services on a referral, and he will admit that they never investigated these injuries of my child. 
So I'm going to ask right now, Mike Thomas, will you please hit the tape? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, here. Hold on. Technical difficulties, please stand by. There we go. August the 21st at 1.30 p.m. We are discussing documents that he had me copy for him for Susan Wolf um, and discuss um, the issues that Susan Wolf had faxed over to Children's Services in 2004 and 2005. Can everybody hear those people? See, this is what Harrison wrote. It says his papa, which was Earl Potter, put his foot in their face. But there's another one, and Susan Wolf couldn't find it. And it's about where he put also his genitals, you know what I'm saying? And his foot in their face, in the kid's face. Okay. Then, if you go down here through these, see where you are. Or I can just show you. I can discuss it. And she it. said in her brother's face? Yeah. Which brother was? Lee Douglas. Okay. Let's see. Here's here, like this one here. See, this is a, this is a record time of day contacted Susan Wolf, PhD. Worried about kids. Visitation. Talk to kids. With your and with children's services, okay. It says crisis intervention treatment. Oh, yeah, we'll follow up with children. children's services. Okay. But see, Susan will followed up with children's services, but nobody followed up with what was going on. Um, see, here's another one Mackenzie Branham in third grade at East Side School, Miss Miller, mom, Kenny, my boy, uh, mom's boyfriend. Went to the campground. Jennifer, her sister, and brothers, brothers, don't like Kenny, threatens to whoop us. Um, before we left, spanked her. So he spanked McKenzie. No other problems with Kenny. Kenny broke the toilet. Campground, they're there every weekend. Used bathroom at campground. McKenzie says, eating enough to eat, wait until, went home. Mama saying, they have to love Kenny to get close. In other words, Marianne was telling them they had to tell that man they loved her or they didn't get any clothes. And the, my biggest, like here, see, this was back to you guys here, Fayette County Children's Services. See? This is a release form. See, this is a release form. This is me signing a release form. Donald Branham, 92605. So that way, she can send anything to you guys. Okay, right here. What? What is this? 05 here? Oh, yeah, 05. Before McKenzie. But look at here. Had been crying, wanting to go to Aaliyah's house. Mom said no. Kenny then dragged her into a bedroom and covered her mouth. Kenny whooped my brothers before. Mackenzie likes to play with Barbara. This is Mackenzie talking. William Potter likes to suck his chest. Pushed your brother into a fireplace. Douglas, 12-inch burn on his back. Douglas told it, William makes both brothers suck their chest. William tells her to do it, but she doesn't. William, William, something her brother their chest. It was like made her brother. Made her brother suck their chest. Their chest. He jealous chest. All the time. See, this is my concern. Now, let me tell you something. Here's your two caseworkers that were handling this back in the this years. Kelly Satchel. Jerry Ann McCoy. 
question is, Dusty, why didn't they ever call the sheriff's department with this sexual stuff going on? They knew about it was going on because it's in their reports. But their reports are, and this is what upsets me, dad's going through a custody battle. They're both trying to dig dirt up on each other. This ain't dirt. This is my kids telling a licensed psychologist what's going on. I'm not even in that room. Um, see right here is one of the things for in the morning here see return form to Jerry and Corey this is what was you know sent Susan Wolf PhD psychologist date 11 12 04 return form to Jerry and Corey that's who was involved but see here's 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 more <laughs> William Potter frankly he comes to the house has been in the house together. He's mean, whoops you. Says he doesn't, does, did nothing to get whooped, anything else. You know, I mean, this is her notes. Yeah. Dad's house plays games with me, plays with sister. Harrison, chores didn't work. Had to go outside to pee. Kenny, how do you get along not fine with him? Something yelling. Always yelling or something. Something yelling. Says he didn't take a, take a shower or a bath. Doug is five years old. And they're at a campground. And this is where your staff went out to investigate where they were staying at. Okay? Because that's in the report. They didn't find nothing wrong, but here's what they're telling Susan Moore. Likes to stay home. Kenny. Something to Kenzie because Kenzie would. Would. He took a shower. See, it almost sounds like Kenny took a shower with her. With Kenzie. Um, Closed McKenzie. Closed. McKenzie. Because Kenzie would. Something, and then it says here he took a shower. Mom, doing okay. Doing okay. Would that be Chase? Chase Kinsey, because Kinsey, Kinsey, would something, would something, yeah, go. Because yeah. Kenzie wrecked go kart. So Kenny, Kenny calls Kenzie, chase Kenzie, because Kenzie uh, wrecked. I say that's go kart, something go kart. He took a shower. Here's another one right here. Dying with family, family concerns regarding his children's situation during visitation. Trying to deal with it on his own. Parent has has been in contact with children's services. Follow up therapy. Um, did Susan testify at any of the hearings? No, not yet. I mean, back when? No, because uh, they went to your agency, and then from your agency, it didn't go nowhere. In other words, no sheriffs were called. Nobody went to court on any of this that was going on. Yeah, with but these when, when you guys were in court. That, Right now, she's right now dealing with everything. We're still seeing her right now again right. with the boys. And she's now writing letters to a judge, you know, letting her know what, what's going on during the sessions because right now it's the two boys and the mom. Kenny's not allowed around the boys at all. Right. They've already but, proved that. About back then when this was going on, which he was No, talking. never went to Judge Hammond's. Why didn't she? I don't know. I don't know that question yet. Because, I mean, if she had all this information... Well, she said she sent it, which she shows. She sent it to you right here. Fax transmission, right there. Donald Branham asked me to do a referring, in this case, referral letters, letter to you. Release, find attached a fax I had sent to Rick Hausman, outlining the concerns regarding abuse. But nothing was done. And here's the letter. There is a letter. There is a letter in here. You got the letter. There's 
a letter in here. We can find it. That was to to Rick Houseman. This one's actually There's a letter to Rick Houseman. See right here. Here's the facts to him. Deliver this to Rick Houseman. Company location, children's services, 335, 3591, whatever, abuse report. Okay? Now, we can find the letter. Do you know what was sent? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find it. <clears throat> I'm trying to find the letter. Because I know I made a copy of it and a copy for you. I can just find it in there. See, this one's delivered this to Dusty Root, right. Children's Services. And that was to tell you that she had already no file to Rick Houseman and not, that never got anything back on why. Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. What, what was sent? Okay, I'm trying to find it. Concern is all these letters were sent from a licensed psychologist to Mike Montgomery, Rick Hausman, not yours, Rick, Rick Hausman, Mike Montgomery, Kelly Satchel, and Jerry M. McCord. But there's no report from your agency to the sheriff's office saying, "Look, we need William picked up. We need Earl Potter picked up. We've got a child in here saying that." this is what's going on sexually to them we need to find out what's going on there was nothing why because well, I'd have to back and look in the record and see what this guy did 
the problem is, I mean, none of them's there anymore for me to ask. Right. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Unless it's in the record, I don't have any way of finding it. But see, that's the thing. There ain't nothing in the record. Because I've got everything you guys got. And if that's the case, I mean, I don't have any way of finding out, you know, what they did or what they didn't do or the funny part is, like, was my gun, Mike Montgomery. There's reports even he went out and supposedly they even say in the police report. I don't have that report, but there's a police report where they say we notified Joe Services Mike Montgomery's coming out to do a follow up. But then there's no report from your agency where he did the follow up. And this is when a time when McKenzie was beat from head to toe, and they in the police department took pictures. There's no pictures. Yeah, remember. Yeah. There's no pictures right. found. There's no report made. You got Rick Houseman, who never followed up with, with Susan Wolf. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. This was serious stuff going on to my children before Mackenzie died. One, a couple of these incidents are just within months before it's 2006 and she died. She died in April or was murdered in April. And these are like in December of 2005. So it's almost, you know what I'm saying, close to even the time that she died. But then there's no, there's no follow. All I've got is Kelly Satchel saying in her note, oh, they're in a custody battle. They're trying to dig up dirt on each other. I've got Corey Ann McCoy saying it's Mr. Brandon's fault. He's just harassing the mother. How? How are you harassing somebody? If somebody was doing something to your child, how is that harassing? How is that digging up dirt? That's somebody doing sexually stuff to my children. I have every right as a parent to be upset what's going on with my children. I know. You know? But then all these times that we were going to that court over here in, in Fayette County, I didn't see Kelly Satchel come in there. I didn't see Jerry Ann McCord come in there. didn't see Mike Montgomery come in there with, with, hey, you know, this is what we know is going on. No, I got reports where they say, oh, it's just a custody battle. And, and what's, what's the setting is your agency, Children's Services Agency, is to protect the children. It doesn't matter what the mom is doing, what the dad's doing, it's about the children. Point blank. If you feel that those kids are something that's going on, then you, and then you guys deal with it. Okay? You know as well as I know, you've been out of my house a ton of times in the beginning. That's how we met. Over just because I, someone called and said I didn't have food in my cabinet, so I didn't have this or I didn't have that, right. you, which was the potters playing their their uh, awesome. games where they were, when they got mad at each other, they would call you guys on each other. You know that and I know that. But the thing of it is, when there was concerns going on with my children, and you're talking about letters coming from a licensed facility saying, look, you need to check into this. Look, you need to see what's going on here. But then there's nothing. There's no... No checking. There's no right because I know they didn't go out and get Earl Potter and bring him in and ask him why are you doing, why are you sticking your stuff in my kid, these kids' in space. Yeah. We know that because if that was true, there would be a, a yeah. sexual, yeah. Um, whatever you call that, or report about it, like there was against Chris West. There's nothing about William and him sucking on my kids' chest and making them suck each other. There's nothing. There's no nothing. But for the sheriff department to know, your agency's got to notify them. Yeah. Yeah. Unless they yeah. don't help with it. I mean, it's every one or the other. So, you know, that's what I was trying to talk to you about a few months ago about I want to make sure this doesn't happen again. Yeah. This does not happen to another kid. Yeah. This does not happen to another um, single parent because they come in and they, they file something. There's a difference. If you go back to the files and you see what I have ever filed on somebody, pretty much it's the true story of what's going on compared to what's been filed on me where it's been stupid. Yeah. Remember when the dog attack happened? Yeah. Oh, three days later, you get a phone call yeah. saying, I had a puppy that attacked Harrison. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. But at the... When? <laughs> So that is one of the tapes, and hopefully everybody can hear it and everything, but that was Children's Services, that was Dusty Roof, and you sat right there and, and you heard him admit, yes, he knew this stuff was going on, 
He knew about the injuries. He knew about stuff that uh, was happening. And I, you got to think back, that was in 2006 when I turned all that over to Children's Services. And like I said, there's nothing I've hidden. Everything I've gotten, everything I've dug up, every hospital report, everything has always been turned over to the authorities. But here we are, 11 years, and still nothing. People, DNAs ain't been done yet. Uh, uh, people ain't been brought in and interviewed the correct way. It's hard to sit here and listen to a tape and listen to children's services admit that they knew what was going on with my children. And because their employees didn't do their job, because if you look at it and you listen to it and you listen to the reports, it's almost sad because I was a man and because I won three kids in a custody hearing and I had three kids. And that's another thing I wanted to bring up before I go back to this tape is also, you got to think about this. Not only did I win custody of all three of my children in Fayette County, but I also had one of all three of my, or two of my sons, because my daughter was dead, in another county. And in both counties, including Fayette County, that I went to court 57 times. And I'll show you. When I said I went 57 times, I went 57 times to court. Right there, 10 pounds of paperwork. And in those 57 times I went to court, I never had a lawyer. Because God always says the one key thing, the truth. And I always told. And I even had Judge Hammonds ask me one time. Mr. Branham, why don't you have an attorney? This is a custody hearing. And I told that judge, because me hiring somebody don't know me, don't know my children, and don't know my family. But by you listening to me and me telling you what I believe in, the love I have for my kids, and that I'm standing here as a parent singly handed to fight for my children. And I got a lot of respect out of Judge Hammonds for that remark. And I can tell you right now, one thing is she's had 16 attorneys. She's used almost every attorney in Fayette County. She's had attorneys in Mason, Ohio. She even, and her last attorney in Montgomery County was from the state's attorney general's office of Cincinnati, Ohio. And even when I got off the elevator and met that lawyer, I told that lawyer, you won't win. Because your client will never tell the truth. And here's the example, and I can prove this. I can bring the paperwork and show it. The day of our final custody hearing in Montgomery County over my two boys, she told her attorney that she was in Kentucky, that her dad was having a pacemaker put in. He already had the pacemaker put in two years prior to that. And when I went in that courtroom, I told that lawyer, told that judge, she's in Kentucky, that's why my client's not here. And I said, Your Honor, she's telling a lie. Can you get on Facebook? And he did. And as she was on Facebook, the first thing she posted within two minutes of while we're in the hearing was her at Walt Disney World Riding a ride. So, but back to, going back to that tape. Like I said, if, and I've said this before, if Children's Services would have done their job when a licensed psychologist was sending referrals, I signed six referrals to release information to Children's Services, if they would have done their job, my daughter would be alive today. But they want to sit there and say, well, why didn't Paint Valley turn it over to authorities? Well, I went and did a little homework myself again. I pulled every sheriff report, every hospital report, and every hospital report, a licensed doctor said my child was being abused. 
And when I got the sheriff report and I matched it to that date of the hospital report, it also stated on the sheriff report that it was abused and that they turned everything over to Children's Services. So Children's Services is the one that failed us. They're the one that failed McKenzie. Because when my daughter was crying for help to a licensed psychologist and was begging for help, she didn't get it. Now, if I'd have known this stuff, and if y'all know the HIPAA law, if I'd have known this stuff, I could have done something. But I didn't find out about this reports until after McKenzie was dead. And I was asked to go get them. Um, it was hard to read it because, like I said, it's McKenzie talking. It's her telling her story of what she was going through, what the people that were doing the things that they were doing to her and her brothers. Um, Mackenzie, eight years old, um, trying to protect her own brothers by telling a doctor that her brothers were being molested. And um, this is not the first time this has happened. Um, years ago, um, prior to that, even another uncle molested my daughter and uh, playing spin the bottle and didn't only do my daughter, but other kids. And uh, nothing came out of that. Um, and I have that police report. I can show it any time. Um, but the key thing here is everybody's asking why I am the way I am, why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, and like the mother has told me, many, many times, too. Why don't you let it go? Why do you keep doing this? Mackenzie wouldn't want this. Let her rest in peace. My daughter's not resting in peace. How is she resting in peace when she's the one that sacrificed her life to save her two brothers and two other kids now that went through the same stuff that this man did to them? Um, as you can sit here and see, I have plenty of tapes. I'm not going to play them all night because we'd be up until 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I have CDs. Um, the show where, like I said, this I've been doing this since 2006. I started this when the mother went on vacation. I figured there was something wrong. Um, some things weren't being answered. Um, so I started investigating. And you can tell, I did my homework. And like I've always told people, you can get on Facebook, you can bash me, you can sit there and say I don't have nothing. I have plenty here. I can vouch for everything and it's all in black and white. All has children's services names on it or Paint Valley's name on it or Fayette County Sheriff's name on it. And like I said, um, I'm going to keep fighting because that's my job. My job as a parent is to find out who killed my daughter. And if it means stepping on toes, and if it means tearing down roadblocks, that's my job. And I'm proud of what I'm doing. People might think it's wrong. People might say it's going to hinder the case. It ain't going to hinder the case. Here's what would have hindered the case. If I had done what the mother's doing, and I would just stayed quiet about this and never went and dug and dig up everything I could dig up, my daughter's case would be sitting on a file collecting dust. That's the God's honest truth. But because my job as a parent is to find out, A, what happened to my daughter, B, who did it, and C, make sure they never do it again to another child. Um... So, like I said, I know there's other pages over there, and they get on there, and, oh, we want to work. There's two sides of this story, and the mom ain't got to tell her story, and blah, 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 blah. I'm begging you. Come and please, please, please come and tell me your story. Because I have you on tape, two tapes, of telling me two different stories of how you left that house that night, how you did this, how you did that that it was diesel fuel, that the insurance adjuster told you that, that Kenny was on a ladder in his underwear. Please, please come and tell me your story, Marianne, because I would love to hear your next story. What I would love for you to do is tell the truth. 
You and Kenny know what happened that night. You and Kenny were there. I have opinion of what happened that night. But I get I can tell you one thing. I'm doing pretty damn good at what I'm doing. Because I'm not the one scared. I'm not the one that has to lay my head on that pillow and think, are they kicking my door in tonight? I don't have to do that. But I can tell you another thing, Mary Potter, for you to sit there and call my daughter your granddaughter, I'll tell you what. I'll never forget what you said in, to me in my driveway. And what you told me in my driveway was, are you kidding me? Quit fighting this. Mackenzie was only here eight years. My daughter's been here 31. I'll never forget you saying that. Because you know what? My daughter would be here 31 years too. If your family wouldn't have done what they did. So now I want to go to another tape. And this tape is me discussing the clothes being destroyed, the ladder missing and stuff. This is with the detective. And we'll go ahead, Mike Thomas, if you can, please. Yes, sir. Go ahead and uh, hit that. You ready? There we go. And let everybody know, Mike Thomas. Yes, sir. Hey, man, what's up? Oh, no, no, no. You done? Yeah, go ahead. I just want to... I got that, um, that, uh, report. What report's that? The Dr. Gage uh, report that was missing. Okay, where'd you get that at? Well, why do you need to know where I got it at? I mean, I, I'm just saying I got it. Well, I understand that, but here's... I'm glad you got it. In order for us to use that in court the, for the... The, um, the prosecutor uses it if the document has to be authenticated. Okay. So, otherwise, it's not making something up or something like that. That's oh. the only reason I asked. Okay. Okay. Well, how about um, we set up a meeting, me and you. How about um, I'll hand you a copy of what I, you know, the coroner's report. And then okay. I will also give you the name and where that document was in because I know you mentioned to me about sending it to uh, if you needed to you could send it to BCI you know whatever and that person already told me that they had no problem with that that way you know you're getting it's coming off of what it should be coming off of you know what I'm saying right. Right. but you got to understand my point in this we know A the clothes were destroyed B we know that there was a report missing and uh, Mesker com confirmed that because, like he said, he went to Dr. Gay's house and asked the wife about that certain uh, handwritten, it's called a handwritten report, but you know what I'm saying. It's one where he goes through and he talks to people and da-da-da, you know what I'm saying? So, but my question of it is, I mean, once you look at it, you can tell it's, it's for real, it's not fake. Um, one, um... I don't understand why uh, Joyce Stanforth gave a statement at the scene. Joy Stanforth, Vernon's wife. I don't know. I don't know. But she gave him a statement at the scene. Um, in her statement, at the bottom of the statement, she even put down, it is reported that the father hates the mother's boyfriend, Mr. Mossberger. So now I know why the sheriff's office wasted three years of not clearing me when they knew exactly where I was. And we're more important looking at towards me, towards the fire. Um, number two, me and you discussed about the, uh, the pickup truck. Uh -huh. And you said that was a red flag to you. Uh -huh. And in this report, it states that the truck was running. Okay. So not only was the, the doors open, open and Marianne's cell phone in the truck on the front seat, which has been confirmed not only by your department, but also by Ron Steen and the fire marshal. Uh -huh. But now also the truck was running. Okay. And my thing is, you was talking to me when, the other day or the day before, and you said to me, you said that um, the truck, you know, was a red flag and that, that there was a possibility that Marianne and Kenny came to the fire 
and might have been eating out or, you know, seeing a movie or whatever, and they might not actually know what really happened and who, who would have done it. But my question to that, to you, is for you to sit there and think that, well, I'm not going to say that. You to sit there and say that, you know, you're going to check into of the truck, the issue with the truck. But if that was true, and then follow me on this, if that was true, that would have cleared Marianne Kenny as far as the fire part. If that, that was true. And that would be something that any normal person would come right off the bat and say, hey, I wasn't here, man. I just came with my truck. You know, the house was on fire, blah, blah, blah. Then the only question that she would have had to answer is then, A, who left the child there, you know, alone, which we talked about that. You said, you know, there's quite a few parents that leave kids home alone. Um, and B, um, if not, who was in the house with McKenzie? You know, either A, she was left alone, or B, she was with somebody babysitting her. So, but then again, why would Marianne then tell 13 stories, including the first story that Marianne gave was to the Record Herald the day of the fire. And that story was that she woke up to popping and crackling noises. Now, for her to wake up to popping and crackling noises in the bedroom, saying that she spoke to McKenzie, told McKenzie to go to the window, and that she exited the back garage door, why then would the truck be sitting in the middle of the road with two doors open and running? I'm just saying, if Marion, you know, with all the years that's gone by, just think, there's been 11 years. She really hasn't put up a fight for her two two sons. You don't understand what I'm saying? As getting custody and seeing them. She ain't even seen them in five years. You know what I'm saying? She was under a supervised visit, and then she turned down the supervised visit, turned down the visit at Paint Valley. If she was driving that truck, I mean, come on, man. I mean, I would say, man, I wasn't there. I came in my truck, bam, you know, I ran out of the well, truck. She might be saying, the reason she may be saying that is she knows that if, she knows that she's going to be in trouble by not being there. Okay. And, you know, that, that's serious trouble. I mean, if you leave your kid there and something happens, they die, they die. Right. They're getting in trouble. Right. Either way, either, either way, either way, she's in trouble. Either way, if she came to the fire scene and left my child there eight years old and, and somebody set this fire and killed my kid in it, then it's no different than the lady that, you know, left her kid in the yard that drowned in the quarry. You don't understand what I'm saying? Well, or, A, or if she was involved, she's in trouble that way, too. No matter what, she's in trouble. Right, right. So that's why she, that would be one reason why she might say, no, I don't want to say that we were gone because I know if I do that, then I'm going to be in trouble for not being here. Right, but not as much trouble. But it's less. It's less trouble than than the murder. Like what happened? To right. The fire. Right. Right. If she's involved in fire, it's more trouble that way than it is uh, just leaving the child at home. Right. Exactly. But as a, as a parent, if you're, I mean, you know as well as I do, when it, there's a crime scene, a fire accident, whatever. There's only one way everything happens. There's only one story. Not 13 stories. You understand what I'm saying? So well, even if we prove that she came there in that truck, even if we prove that she came there, she still held that for 11 years. She also made up 13 stories of, you know, what happened that night in the fire. But just like Kenny's story of that he put the ladder up there, went in her room, try to find her, and then you guys crush that story immediately. Why would you tell that story, even Kenny tell that story, if he came to the fire? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. But, it, it, you know, I guess the reason what I heard, now, you know, the reason Kenny said that is because he was a firefighter, he wanted to be the hero, hero. tried to be the hero. Right. And that's why he made up that story. Yeah, but then when 
it comes out that he lied, I mean, that really didn't make him look like a hero, did it? Yeah, not at all. And, and then, like I said, so my question is, and I'm glad, I'm glad you're on the, the truck. I mean, that truck's a big part of this case because we know the truck was running. We know the truck was sitting in the middle of the road and the fireman had to move it. We know that, but so that somebody was in that truck. Whether, and if you look at it with two doors open, that means two people in that truck. Because I just don't see somebody jumping out of the driver's side, leaving that door open and coming around and opening a passenger side. Do you understand what I'm saying? Exactly, yes, yes. I mean, that would be almost stupid. But the thing of it is, I, here's what I believe, and you always ask my theory on stuff. And I believe that, I believe they know what happened with the fire. I believe they was in the house, but I don't believe they were in the house when the fire was set. I believe, though, they jumped in that truck and was going to do exactly what you're looking into. They were going to pull off and then try to come back to the fire as people were arriving, you know, to the fire. But I believe when they got in the truck and was backing out, and that's why the truck was facing the railroad tracks, it wasn't facing Maple Street. It was facing the railroad tracks. I believe they panic when they heard all the sirens because if you're hearing sirens and you're in a truck and you're getting ready to leave, somebody now has a better chance seeing you leaving the scene than coming to the scene. Right. And I think they jumped out of that truck when they heard the sirens and people coming. I think they're, they're I don't think, uh, I think the, the fire part got out of their control to what they were planning. Uh, you, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say? What they planned? Yeah, what Marianne and Kenny planned. So you think Marianne and Kenny set the fire? No, I believe they planned that fire. I believe they, they, I believe whatever happened in my daughter's bedroom, the fire was to cover up whatever happened in my daughter's room. Well, if we're going on a theory that they weren't home. No, I didn't say that. I said they weren't in the house when the fire was set. Well, see, that's what, but I'm kind of thinking that they weren't home. Because if they're driving down the street, let's, came, let's say they came off Maple Street, driving down through right. there, turn there toward the railroad truck, right. and come in and see the house on fire, they stop in front of the house, they can get out of the truck, both on each side. Okay. That would make a logical. That would be logical for the the reason why the truck was in the road and both doors were open. Okay, but it wouldn't make it logical as far as why would Kenny take his shirt off, his shoes off, and Marianne take her shoes off? Because Marianne, Marianne went to a house and asked for a pair of shoes, and we have that witness. Also, Kenny, I mean, you would be fully dressed. You wouldn't be running around banging on doors half naked. Right. If you're coming there to the house, you see what I'm saying? Right. But you would be maybe half naked or no shirt on, or if you're exiting, you know, if you're leaving the scene and was going to come back to the scene. But then there's a lot of there's a lot of holes in her conversation there because one conversation, Marianne says, I mean, your witnesses of the night of the fire are the best because they were standing there, they talked to Marianne. But even in this report, even in this report, the fireman said, the fireman said in the coroner's report, it was 15 to 20 minutes before Marianne and Kenny even told them McKenzie was in that house. Was she supposed to be someplace else? That goes back to David Dye. Who the one that made the remark that McKenzie wasn't supposed to be in the house? You see what I'm saying? But I'm going by what the coroner asked people that was at the scene, and he asked people like the firemen and all that. He even describes their clothes in the report. Doctor Gay does, and in this report, he also says that the clothes were wet. He did not say they were singed. He did not say they were water damaged. He said they were wet. And when I talked to Ron Steeman. Me and him came to the same conclusion. We know we don't have the clothes now. We know they're destroyed. But could that wetness been a settlement? Could that wetness been her pee? 
could that way. You see where I'm going? You know what I'm saying? But without those clues, we'll never know that, right or wrong. Right. So, I want, like I said, my main thing is I would like for you to see this report. I would like to... Yes. And then, like I said, if you want the true, the true, you know, because I know what you just said and I understand what you're saying, we can get that. We can do that. But the problem of it is, like me and Ron Steeman talk, and me and Jesse, we talk. First of all, why don't you all have this report? Well, that's something. I don't know where the king. I don't know where the report came from or what. Obviously, you had to dig someplace and find it that we wouldn't. We didn't know it. We didn't even know it existed. You're right. Like said, we don't. Now, Mester did. We never got those notes. But me. but Mester did because he said. When he went to retrieve McKenzie's files at Dr. Gates' house, the handwritten, what they call handwritten notes, that's when the, the coroner's at the scene, mm -hmm. was missing. And he even asked Dr. Gates' wife, are you sure he don't have a desk drawer somewhere, a filing cabinet somewhere? But it goes back to the question, too, is when, and this is a revised code, Code 1311.4. When a corner office officer does not have an office, and I mean office like they used to have here in, in Fayette County that burned down and a lot of people's stuff got destroyed in that fire. When they don't have an office, everything is supposed to be filed within the common pleas court. Okay? Now, I know Dr. Gay's not here and he can't answer these questions, but they weren't. And it also says in that revised code, they are not to take a case home with them to their home. And there's a reason why. The reason why you don't take something like that home is, I don't know, you don't know, if Dr. Gay knows somebody that came over for a cookout and there's McKenzie's board sitting on a desk and somebody picks it up and reads it. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So they're supposed to be filed with a common police court. A, that was never done. B, there on, on May 31st, 2006, was the last thing filed in McKenzie's reports. Now, the clothes were destroyed in August of 2006. That wasn't put in there. The This report wasn't put in there. So, do you understand why I have red flags and why I'm doing what I'm doing? Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, you know, we don't keep or have access to the coroner's records. Those are his records. Right. And she doesn't have access to our records. So, you know, we don't really know. You know, he kind of does his own thing. Some of them make you handwritten notes because some people may do it on tape recorder. You know, however they do that. Right. Um, but that's their thing, not ours. Right. Um, so, yeah, um, I'll give you a call back. Uh, I don't know what I got going on tomorrow. I know I got a trial on Thursday. I got to have to get ready for work tomorrow. So, uh, that's fine. It's not going nowhere. It's not like I'm going to lose it. Trust me. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I'll, I'll try to get them as soon as I can. I want to get them as soon as I can and make a look at them and see what they say and things like that. So, the other thing, too, is uh, have you found the tape recorders yet? Pardon me? My two tape recorders. Oh, I haven't, I haven't got to those yet. The tape recordings you want, right? Yeah, but, well, I mean, you can do like BCI did. You can take the original tapes, burn them on a CD, and then give me my original back. Right, right. Yeah. But I want to know if they're still there. My next question, if you don't care to answer it, is... Yeah, I, I, go ahead. Bear with me. You're, I sound like I'm on a speaker system or something because you keep on coming in and out. So it's, it's hard for me to hear. I'm in my garage. Because okay. I don't want my kids to hear, you know what I'm saying, my conversations. Okay. Um, my question is, um, do you all still have the ladder? The lighter? Ladder. Ladder, no. Why wasn't that held? I can't tell you that, Don. Oh. I, I, I don't know. Oh. I, I wasn't even here working then. So. Right, I know that. I know this is hard. I know have been through this before. There's things that happen that I can't answer. Right. We're going to have an answer. Right. I know you're, I'm, I know that. I know you came in after Detective Brown died. I'm not, I've never accused you. Did I, I've never, have I ever said, 
Brian McFarland, you're a crook. You're the one. You're hiding stuff. I never said that, have I? Right. I'm just saying that I, 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 if I could answer that stuff for you, I would, but I can't. I don't have an answer for that. I don't know why they didn't keep the ladder. I don't know. Because here's the thing, you know that was part of the crime scene too because Kenny made a statement that he used that ladder. Mm -hmm. He said that he used it, yeah. Right. But then, he, then again, he recanted and said that he didn't go up the ladder to get her out. Right. You know, he, he didn't go try to get her out like he said. Right. So. All right, when, All right. Can, when can you find out about the, the tape recorders? Um, how about give me till the first next week? First and next one. Deal. Yep. Okay. You, you got my cell phone number, obviously. Um, yeah. When you're ready, I want you, you can come, and I'm, I'm not going to meet you at the annex building. You can meet me at my home. Okay. And you can pick up this, a copy of this report. I will give you a name, where the report right. came from, and why, how I know why this is a true report. And while you're here, if you don't care, make sure you got enough time. I just want to show you what I some things I have that might okay. might give you a little more better of a point of view of where to look. Okay. If you don't okay. if you don't care, I mean that's just respect for me. Yep, that's fine. I mean, obviously, you know, I have nothing to hide. Right. Right. And obviously, I'm not afraid to go toe to toe with anybody. This is a this is about my baby. This is about Mackenzie. I understand. It's nothing to do with me. It's got nothing to do with you. It's got nothing to do with anybody else. It has to do with a little child that died a horrible death, and somebody needs the answer for that death. Yeah, I, I'm with you 100% on that. All right. Okay. All right, buddy. Uh, like I said, I got it. I read a little bit, but I'd rather put it in your hands. That way you know that I put it in your hands, and no one can't say I didn't give it to you. Great. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. So now, back to, um, like I was saying, that was uh, one of the detectives working on a case. And uh, as you can see, they um, no longer have the ladder. They no longer have the clothes. Um, they were destroyed. Um, we don't know why they were destroyed. Um the report that I turned over to them, I actually gave them to them the day that um, that him and the sheriff came to my house to tell me that McKenzie was being exhumed the next day. Um, so back to, this is why I am fighting like I'm fighting. This is why I am standing up to what's going on with my daughter's case. This is why I'm putting my head out there. This is why I'm hoping that the community supports me. This is why I'm hoping that the community will ask questions too. Um, like I said, the night that Mackenzie died, part of me died, but also part of those children that went to school with her died with her too. And those kids deserve as much answers as I deserve. And like I said, um, because I posted her picture of her in the casket and everything else, um, it made people come to me. I've gotten text messages, private messages of, that I turned over to the sheriff's office. I've gotten um, a child that came to me that lived the same life my daughter did with that same person, um, with Kenny. Um, like I said, uh, I've had a tomato thrown at me. I've had... Um, People credit me in Walmart um, on that side of the family. And, and like I said, it goes back to the, the to the main question, and that is, if I'm trying to find out who killed McKenzie, then I'm also trying to find the same person that tried to kill these two. So why would you attack me? Why would your family threaten me in Walmart? Why would you come by my house and throw a tomato? Only on one reason. And that reason is because I'm going to find who killed my baby. And because I'm getting closer to what happened to my daughter and, and, the, and the, the whole um, thing that's wrong with certain people is you only look at a picture this much. I look at the picture like this. And not to disrespect detectives and all that because there is some good detectives, but 
when you're a detective and you have three 15, 25 cases coming in, McKenzie's case goes over here. And then they start working on another one. Where the difference between me is I have every day. I have all day. I think about this all the time. So, and the difference between me and this one is this is the, the detectives over here, and they'll get to it when they can. This one over here, this is the father. And this is the father that wants answers. So, I have all the time in the world. And the difference is between this and this is just like in the courtroom when you hire a lawyer. Over here, they have certain guidelines that they have to follow. There's certain things they have to do. I have no guidelines. I have no rules to follow. So, the way I handle the case and the way I do the case is by father and, and the love for my daughter. So, being that, I see things, I hear things, and I look at things different than a detective would. You got to remember, my daughter was with me some, from the time she was born up until three months till she was murdered. No one knows my child better than I do. I'm the one that sits here and I have files and files of poems that my little girl wrote. I have handprints. I have footprints. That's my child. No one knows that child better than I do. And there's a reason, and the mother ought to know this, I fought so hard to get custody of my kids and I got them without an attorney. Why wouldn't I fight as hard to find out why my daughter died a horrible death in the care of the mother? So, like I said, you can sit here and look at everything on my table. I have done nothing but try to find out what happened to my daughter. So, for the people out there that that want to get on there and try to show my history of what I did in the past, what I, let me tell you something, if I was as bad as people are trying to make me out to be, the person that killed my child would not be alive today. So, as that is to be said, the only thing I want to do is I want to be able to stand in front of that person or persons in a courtroom, speak for my daughter, and ask why you took that little baby, eight-year-old, life away. And these other children that went through that same punishment that my daughter did by getting locked in rooms, hands covered over the mouth, dragged down the hallway, having to force to kiss somebody and tell them they love them and they're their daddy. They get that chance and that opportunity too to look at that person and ask the same question. So not only am now, by this young gentleman coming forward to me, now it's made me want to fight harder because it wasn't only my daughter that suffered, but other children that suffered too. In the hands of these two parents that can't come forward, that can't walk into a sheriff's office and tell the truth of what happened that night. Like I said, there's only one way everything happened that night in that fire, not 13. And my point of it here, too, is it don't matter if you're a fireman or not. Why would you lie and say you put a ladder against a house and try to save my daughter? Why would you go the same morning that you're told that your daughter is dead? And give a statement at the Record Herald. Because, honestly, I should have been looking for a ex-wife out of her mind. Seeing a doctor. Seeing a psychologist. And I can prove this too. She even court ordered three times to take a psychiatric evaluation. And has refused it. The mother has. And I've got court papers to show it. So... Why would you make up and lie? Because you think anybody care whether you are a hero or not a hero? 
Because I can tell you one thing. The heroes are every one of those firemen that night that risked their life not knowing if they were going home to their babies. Those are the heroes, not Kenny Mossberger. I'm ashamed that he's even considered a fireman. Because if you look at the code of a fireman, they ain't no different than a parent. It's to sacrifice their life to save a life. That's a true fireman. And there's plenty of them in Jeffersonville. There's plenty of them in Washington Courthouse, Ohio. And I feel bad that those firemen could have died trying to save my child's life. And then there have been another family suffering. And for that mother and that boyfriend not to have that respect, that's sick. Not what I post on Facebook. Because those two never thought in that 20 minutes they were standing up in a yard and on a porch to let a fireman know where my daughter was. Instead, these firemen went in blinded, searching for victims when the whole time the, the two parents, if you want to call them parents, knew where that baby girl was. And the sad part about it, my daughter was bed was under a window on the alley side where there wasn't even no fire. And even the sheriff even admitted in his own statement, the fire never reached her bedroom and never reached her body. But in that 20 minutes could have made a big difference of how that baby come out of that house. And like I said this before, I'd rather have my daughter every day burned, but at least I can love on her, kiss her, hug her, and talk to her than to go to a, a grave and have to do it. So you people out there want to bash me, you better think real hard and real quick that one day it could possibly happen to your child. And you'll be sitting here doing the same thing I'm doing, I guarantee it. Because if you don't, you're not a parent. You don't have the love for your child. Because our job as a parent is to sacrifice our lives for theirs. No hesitation whatsoever. You shouldn't even think about what should I do. It should be an automatic instinct if you're a parent. Now, I have another tape, but it's getting late. I will play some more tapes. I will, like I said, keep fighting for my baby. And anybody wants to get in my way, all the power and glory to you. Um, but I can tell you one thing. If you're smart, you don't want your fingers in that cookie jar. Unless you really, for surely, for a fact, know facts. Because when you start making comments... You're putting yourself there. But I want to say one thing. I, I, like I said, I appreciate every mother in Fayette County, in other states of the United States that have contacted me. Um, dads out there, single dads, fathers. I appreciate every one of you that walk up to me and say, I'd have died with my baby. Because honestly, I wish I'd have got that opportunity. There's not a day goes by that I wish I would not have made it to there and got in that house because I would have. I would have gave my last breath to be with her because I know that's what she would have wanted. Instead, she died a lonely death with two parents that should have done everything they could have got her out of that house. Instead, their greed, and that's what it is, greed, took over and they allowed her to die alone in that home, in that bedroom. So, I salute every parent <coughs> that comes to me and tells me that they would have died with that baby. And 
it's sad when you even have children that are grown now and even said, if I only knew, I'd have went in there and tried to save your daughter. And that's so much touch that touches me in so many ways that even a stranger, uh, a friend, would have risked their lives to go in there and save my baby. And uh, I know Mackenzie knows that. And, and I know Mackenzie wants everything that I'm doing and everything this community is doing, they want. And, and I know that's what she wants. And she does not want to lay there in that grave thinking nobody cares. And a remark was made by a certain person. I won't give a name. They know who they was. But a remark was made, and that remark was, anyone that stands with Donald Branham doesn't stand with that child. Um, and that's pretty hard um, core for somebody to make a statement like that. Um, my daughter believes in me. My daughter knows what I'm doing. My daughter's happy that I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, my daughter's proud of me. And so are my other children. And so is my wife. And so are my friends. And as long as I have them and that strength, you ain't going to stop me. And you can make any comments you want to make. You can slander me. You can say what you want to say. Um, it's not going to stop me. I've been doing this for 11 years, and I'm going to keep on doing it. Like I said, I'm not afraid to step on toes. If you don't want to do your job, find another job. Um, no, I'm not a detective. No, I don't have a degree in it, but I'll tell you what. I think I've done pretty damn good of what I have found and what I do know. And pretty much I'm close to what happened to my baby that night. And uh, that's what she wanted. And she's the one that puts those thoughts in my head. She's the one that gives me that strength. She's the one that talks to me and tells me what to do next. And uh, so for those that are on uh, this, let's... Uh, Let's uh, really chat. Really chat. Uh, Which I like to say hi to. Say it, County. Hey, y'all want to get on there and bash me? All the power and glory to you. You want to bring up my history? I've already told everybody. If you want to uh, disgrace me, that's fine. But I can tell you one thing. You're the ones that's got to answer to God why you treated me the way you did. You're the one that's got to answer to God why you are making the remarks you are about a child that belongs to him because that's God's child. And you got to remember one thing, and that's what I stand by. Jesus sacrificed his life for all of us. And it's no different what he, Jesus has done that I'm doing for my daughter. And that is I'm sacrificing my life to find answers for my daughter. Um, another thing I want to clear up too, real quick is the stuff that Derek Myers wrote on my page, um, trying to speak for my daughter. I didn't know it. I didn't read it. Everybody text messaged me, told me, don't read it. Probably a good thing. I didn't read it. Um, I heard it was pretty nasty, pretty harsh, um, words. Um, trust me, my daughter wouldn't have wanted that. That's not her. Um, nobody knows what her final words were, if there was any. Um, I can guarantee it wasn't that. Um, from what I've been told by people, I know it hurt a lot of people. I know it upset a lot of people. Um, I talked to a few deputies that I'm not going to mention their names that standing there talking about what Derek wrote, um, watching the tears roll out of their eyes. Um, tells me it was probably pretty bad. But um, I did ask the man to take it down. He did take it down. Um, I've said this before. Um, I've told a few people. And um, I used Derek Myers to get my story out. That's the God's honest truth. Um, Derek Myers, uh, back in 2006, my ex-wife wrote him a story telling her side of the story to him. He was going to publish it in a thing called The Blaze. I went to Derek and told him, go ahead. I've got the evidence, which you can see. Um, so if you post anything false, I'm going to sue you. Um, 
I guess he forgot about the, that happening back then, and I thought it was better than to use the man that uh, sided with the mother um, in 2006. So I called him up, told him I was going to do a live story, show some evidence. I knew his page was big. A lot of people like Derek Myers. A lot of people don't. Um, as far as an investigator, he was never my investigator. He never went out and did anything for me. Um, what he did do was he did stir up some trouble by going and knocking on doors and telling people that he was my private investigator and he was a journalism and all this stuff. And pretty much they ran him off. They contacted me. Um, the state officials did, told me that um, you need to get away from him. He's going to ruin what you're doing. Um, so I cut my ties with Derek Myers. Um, a lot of people ask me where he is. I don't know. I have no clue where Derek Myers is, and I really don't care where he is. Um, I don't know. Some of you that are his viewers should pay attention to what he wrote. I don't, um, like I said, he's already deleted it, but it was pretty um, sad and nasty. Um, you just don't do that. And to me, he's no better than the ones on Fayette County, let's really chat, that got on there and said what they said. But like I'm going to say this before, if you're going to come over on my page because I don't hide nothing, and you're going to look at something, that's yourself. But don't take what you see on my page and go to another site and post it and bash me because um, that's not going to get you nowhere. Um, makes you look like the bad person. Um, like I said, uh, I can name names I'm not going to. Um, they know who they are. Um, the truth will come out. And I can guarantee you one thing with what I have here on this table. When they make their arrest, I, I will be able to sit back and say, I told you so. Um, black and white pictures, photographs, tapes don't lie. Um, like I said, the mother, if she ever wants to tell a story, hey, I'm fine. Come and tell it. I would love to hear the story. Um, if it was an accident, please tell us why you think it was an accident. Um, but I can tell you one thing. The fire marshal's um, department has said it is an arson that's never going to change. So whatever they want to come and tell me, I'm, I'm all ears. Come and tell it. Um Millions of people would like to hear your story. Um, but I also, I'll put the offer out there again to the ex-wife. Anytime you want to go to Sheriff's office with me, I'll go up there. I'll back you 100%. But um, I don't think that'll ever happen. Uh, those out there that wants to, like I said, come by and throw tomatoes. And um, I think that's childish. Um Shows me you're a little boy. Uh, but when you throw it and you miss and you almost hit my nine-year-old son, that has nothing to do with this. When we're sitting out on our picnic table trying to enjoy um, a meal as a family together. Um, why don't the people on Let's Really Chat, Fayette County, whatever this site's called. Um, why don't you all bash that person? You know, they almost hit a seven-year-old, nine-year-old kid with a tomato. Um, that's sick. That's what's sick. And that's what you got to decide on what is really sick and what really ain't sick. Um, I've had some people that have um, sent me messages and apologized. I accept those apologies. Um, like I said, if you want to get on there and say something about me, go ahead and say it, but don't take it and go to another page, block me, and then start a bashing on me. Um, like I said, uh, I try to throw out little things and jokes and stuff like my address with Mr. Rogers and and um, thank you, Mike Thomas, for that uh, making that site for me. Um, but uh, that's so uh, they, people will get me back on track and we can laugh and, and get my spirits back up. Those are true friends. Um, that do that for me. Um, like I said, uh, I know a lot of people wonder who Mike Thomas is. Mike Thomas is a friend, a very close friend. Um, you might not like his opinions. That's fine. He might not like your opinions. Um, but 
when you go on a site and, and you say what you say and then you delete it real quick and then you deny that you said it, you got to remember there is a thing called uh, where you take the picture, screenshot, and I've always kept them. So when you get on my page and you say something, don't think I ain't screenshotting it because I do. Um, because I already know you're going to go to somewhere else and you're going to say you never said that. Um, that's why I have these tapes. Everybody that knows me very well knows I tape every conversation with every official I'm with um, because of that reason right there. It's because they'll get on there and say, well, I didn't say that to Mr. Branham, and I can show you that he did, or they did, or her did. Um, my goal here is, A, to find out who killed my daughter, B, to make sure this doesn't happen again to any child in Fayette County, C, to make sure that our children's services recognize what happened here and the mistakes they made and, and that they correct the mistakes that they made. Um, Mackenzie, you know, the, I hate to say this, but there's always that part where it's the saddest thing you ever hear is it always takes something bad to happen before something good. And it's sad that Mackenzie had to die for things to turn good. And we need to change that. Um, Children's services, one thing they need to do is quit sending letters. You know, it, if you want me to, I will pay, I will pay your, I will put the gas in your car to come down the stairs, get in the car and drive to an incident when it's reported. Don't mail a letter out and tell somebody you're coming in seven days and investigate. I will pay your gas. If you need it, I will do something. We will collect $25 gift certificate cards, gas cards, and we'll pass them out to all the employees at Children's Services. So you got a gas card so that you can come downstairs, get in your car, and go to the scene. Um, I just want, like I said, to make sure that everyone knows the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. And um, I know uh, Mike Thomas posted some pictures of stuff I did. I did not do that out of re recognition. I don't want to be recognized for anything. I love kids. And the thing I did in the park was for McKenzie. McKenzie's wanted, wanted to do it. And it was for bullying, abuse, and no child goes hungry in Fayette County. When I do stuff, it's not always me that does it. It's my daughter. My daughter will say, Dad, I want you to do this. Just like when I got connected with um, um, uh, the Dollar Tree. And I went out there on Valentine's Day. And two other fathers, single fathers, put up money. And we put up $300. And every kid that come in there got to buy their mom a Valentine's Day gift. And the enjoyment of watching those kids smile and try to hide that gift from their mom in the store um, to give it to their mom. And just like the families that came to the park, we fed 600 families that day. Didn't cost nobody nothing. Fayette County Sheriff's Office, bam. They put up the money for the hot dogs and all that. Kroger's, bam. They put up the money and everything for the bread, the chips, the ice, my family put up the pop and stuff. All the community businesses gave donated um, a gift. Um, nobody had to pay for nothing. They came out. All they had to do was bring the canned food. That canned food got them tickets for the gifts that were on the table. They got a free meal. You know, you got to think about it. Is That day was so joy because the way Mackenzie looked at it, she knew that night every kid that came there went home with a full belly. You got to think about this. We have a lot of kids that don't get a meal in this town. So by me doing what I did was because my daughter wanted me to do it. Just because she's dead does not mean she don't live with us, within us and that she don't touch our hearts and, and guide us the right way. Like I said, I didn't have the perfect record. I, and like I've told people before, I never said I was a good guy. Never said that. But I don't have no felonies. Um, but like I said, a lot of the things that I do is because of McKenzie. Um, 
you know, I got to reunite with a girl that I played Santa Claus and, and that little girl come in and touched my heart. Um, happened to be that day she wore a butterfly dress, you know, she got a Christmas. Now, you know, 10 years later, I, I reunited with that girl and it was the most wonderful thing. Um, the day I did the Big Bird and walked around like Big Bird in the park with, during the fishing tournament and watching all those kids come up and stand beside me and get their picture taken, it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with the kids, the children, the smiles on their faces, the parents that got to go home and listen to that kid say, oh my God, I got to see Big Bird, you know, and, and the parents got to, to laugh and, and enjoy that moment with their child and the memories. And I, the thing we need to do, we need to do more in this community for these kids. Um, we need to be more together as a community than going on Facebook and trying to bully somebody and hide behind a phone or hide behind a computer. You know, uh, if you don't like me, that's fine. Come on my page. Say, hey, Don Branham, I don't like you. I don't like what you're doing. I don't, I don't stand for what you're doing. And I'll, that'd be great. That'd be awesome. I know who you are. I won't bother you. You can go your way. I'll go my way. But don't come on my page and then go to another page, block me, and then start bashing me. Because I guarantee you one thing. I've said this a thousand times. I probably know where you live. And it's not a threat. You know, how do you know I'm not going to come there? And you might need a prayer. You might need somebody to pray for you. And I've said this before, too. That's why I don't go to churches in Fayette County, because I've been to a church in Fayette County, and I sat right beside somebody that I knew that said they were a Christian, had the Bible on their lap, and I knew they didn't like me. Do they talk bad about me? Do they talk bad about my daughter? So, you know, when people sit there and say, oh, I'm a Christian, or, or hey, that person wouldn't say that, they're a Christian. No. Because a true Christian doesn't do nothing wrong. They live by nothing but Christ. So, um, I will get with everybody again. I'm not done here. Um, I just wanted to point out a few things. I promised that I would play some tapes to the community, let them hear it for their own selves, hear what's being said, that they admitted what went wrong, what happened, and uh, just shine a little light on it. Like I said, um, I just don't want this to happen again to somebody else and their child. Um, I know that we've lost quite a few kids in Fayette County in the years and the hardest thing as a parent is losing a child. We always believe that we never would bury our kids, that our kids would bury us. Um, so when you're on there and you're getting ready to make that comment towards me, um, think twice, you know, and, and take your shoes off and slide them underneath the couch and put mine on. And uh, when you put mine on, just focus and think what I'm thinking. And I guarantee you, you're going to come out the same way I did. And you're going to say, man, I would do what he's doing. That's a father. I would fight for my child. Um, so please, I'm asking if, you know, you got a problem with me, man, send me a private message. Ask me to meet you out in the woods, down on a bridge. But don't do something at my home where my children are. Don't attack my kids. Because my kids have nothing to do with this other than supporting their father. Um, they, have, they, have, they deserve answers of what happened to their sister and who did it. So with that said, I praise everybody that supports me. I praise everybody that supports Mackenzie. Because that's the thing, Mackenzie. It's justice for Mackenzie. And I praise all of the parents out there that want to see change. And want to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And the um, my last and final thing is I praise every single one of you out there that would have risked their life. That come up and tell me that they wish they could have been there to save my baby. 
And I know the night of the fire, there was three people that tried to save Mackenzie and was stopped um, by the boyfriend um, from saving my daughter. Um, I appreciate you, those three people that risked um, their not hesitating, knew that there was a child in there and wanted to save that baby. Um, it touches me every day. Um, all I can say is I thank everybody. Um, I hope this puts a light on some things and uh, makes some changes go here. Um, if you support me, thank you. If you don't support me, thank you. Um, but the answers will come out. I believe the answer is in this stuff. There's more I'm still searching. There's more I'm still trying to get. I'm hoping that Fayette County Sheriff's Office will give me the tape, will find the tape. Um, the last I heard, they couldn't find them. Um, hopefully they will, and uh, it won't be another thing that they've lost. Um, with that said, I love everybody. I love all my supporters, and Mackenzie loves every single one of y'all. Thank you.